let's look at this problem that we have mentioned a few times before. Um, what would be the best model to select? And the guiding uh, principle in selecting a model is the question of how well does a chosen model generalize? To start with, let me take this simpler example where we have um, uh, an input space with two dimensions. So our examples are coming uh, with two dimensions or, or two features x1 and uh, x2. And for simplicity, <clears throat> let's say that these are binary uh, options. So we have um, 0 and 1 as possibilities for x1 and x2. So taken all together, we have four possible inputs, four possible combinations of um, 0 and 1. And um, in general, this would be for such Boolean functions the, if the input is d-dimensional, so not just two-dimensional, but, but two di uh, d-dimensional. We would have um, um, 2 to power d possible inputs. And if in the output we aim to give um, a, a 0, 1 kind of output. So for each such combination, we want to give um, uh, 0, 1. And so because you have so many inputs and each one of them can be labeled as either 0 or 1, so you have two possibilities, um, that gives us um, 2 to power 2 to power d possible functions or possible hypotheses. And the aim of our learning process is to look at the data we have and try to eliminate some of these possible functions and, and see what we are left with. And I give you one example of, of how this goes. If you, if you are given a data point, for example, 0, 1. Uh, so somebody says, well, for 0, 1, the real value, uh, the real label uh, that you should look for is, is 0. So, so that would be in your example uh, set. So that means that for this entry, uh, uh, 0, 1 in your input, you would expect the label to be 0. So that means that wherever you have a hypothesis that, that outputs 1, you would already say, well, this is not reasonable. I'm going to exclude this from my set of possible functions. And the same goes for h6 as well, and for h7 and for h8. So already by having this uh, example, you have eliminated this 4. And as a matter of fact, you can see that also here you have 1. So you are also eliminating these ones. But you are still left with quite a number of possible functions. And then you are looking at the next um, sample. And, and based on that, you try to figure out which one of these hypotheses um, are not consistent with that data point and so on. But the point is that you do have a huge amount of, of possible functions in this case, and, and certainly uh, even more if you if you do, uh, for example, regression, or um, if you do multi-class classification. And to um, to eliminate everything and, and come out with a unique solution fitting the data is going to be a very difficult problem. So that's the concept of learning being an ill-posed problem because data is, is never in practice going to be enough to find a unique solution. And so what you do as a response to this, you are going to make some assumptions about which are the reasonable functions you expect to explain that data. And it's not that they are the only explanation for that data, it's just that you don't have enough data to explore all possible set of explanations. So you are going to make assumptions and you are going to fix your hypothesis set in a way that we have seen also in some of the other lectures. And that's going to uh, include the so-called inductive bias. Uh, just as soon as you fix your hypothesis set, uh, that gives you this inductive bias. And so the question, um, indeed, the most important question is that of generalization. How well a model performs on, on new data. And this is where the question becomes one of um, how complex a model should you be choosing, or whether it should be a hypothesis set that is rather more complex in structure or, or maybe 
one that is um, uh, simpler in structure. And the point here is that if you choose a hypothesis set which is very complex, uh, certainly more complex than the class your example was coming from, or, or more complex than the uh, function describing um, uh, your, your sample, then you are going to do uh, overfitting. You, you simply uh, chose a hypothesis that uh, has uh, uh, too much complexity, so it comes too close to the data points, but is going to miss any other uh, uh, or most of the other real points uh, outside of your sample set. On the other hand, if you, do, if you choose a hypothesis set which is uh, clearly less complex than the uh, class your examples are coming from or, or the function that describes your examples, then you are going to do underfitting. You don't have enough flexibility in your hypothesis set to come reasonably close to the data points. And so it's important to realize that we have a trade-off between three factors. Um, and one is uh, the complexity of your hypothesis set. Obviously, you can choose a simpler model or a more complex model. Um, and another factor is that of a training set size. You can choose more examples or, or less examples, and there is a cost associated to collecting more data. And you do that for the goal of um, estimating and minimizing, as a matter of fact, the generalization error on new data, on data that you haven't even seen. And the, uh, the point is that as you increase the number of samples you take, then the generalization error of your model is going to decrease. You are going to have a model which is more and more specific to data coming from the uh, real distribution you are you are interested in learning. So as n increases, certainly the generalization error is going to decrease. The interesting point is about this complexity of the hypothesis uh, class. So as you take a very, very simple class of um, uh, hypotheses, uh, you are going to have probably a large generalization error. And so you go to slightly more complex um, uh, um, uh, hypotheses, and as this complexity of the hypothesis increases, you are going to see the generalization error decreasing. You are getting better and better at um, you know, approximating new data. And then at some point, an interesting point comes that you, you just uh, you know, pass the threshold and your hypothesis class is going to be much too complex for the data you have in front of you. And then this generalization error is going to increase because your hypothesis becomes too much about the data you have in front of you and it's missing uh, the trend and is rather trying to capture um, all these um, uh, all this noise in, in the data you have in front of you. And so <clears throat> and so here is uh, um, one one hint at how to decide on the optimal complexity of your hypothesis set, how to uh, you know, decide when have you increased your complexity, um, the complexity of your model enough. Uh, and that is, take a look at this generalization error. And uh, the moment you see it, um, you know, that it starts increasing after having de decreased for a while, then that's the point where you say, well, my, my model is now complex enough, so I'm going to stop here. The difficulty with this, of course, is that this is about generalization error on new data. So this is something that you don't have in front of you and, and very often you don't have information about the distribution that this new data follows. And um, you will have to do something to estimate this generalization uh, error on new data. So here comes the idea of cross-validation and the idea that you would uh, have an approximation or an estimation of the generalization error. And the point is that you are going to get a data set and part of that data set you are going to keep on the side. So during training, I'm going to keep part of the data and not use it for, train it, for training. And so the point with this is that we are going to split the data into uh, a training set and we are going to choose uh, our first hypothesis set and uh, train it as well as we can 
you know, find the uh, values of the parameters that minimize the um, empirical error on this training set. And then we are going to check how what's the error, the empirical error of that model on this validation set that was never used to optimize this one. And then we say, fine, okay, so I see the empirical error on this uh, validation set, and that's a good indication of how my model is going to be, behave on data that, that it has never seen before. So then I, I, I will say, well, okay, but maybe this is not good enough. I'm going to go, go back to my training set and, and say, well, <clears throat> let me increase the complexity of my model. And um, I'm going to choose a, another hypothesis, slightly more complex. And again, I'm going to train it on this training set. And then once uh, I found, uh, you know, the optimal values of my parameters, I'm going to, again, for this more complex set, estimate its ability to um, approximate new data. And I'm going to do that by estimating the empirical error on the validation set. And, and then I'm going to say, okay, is this better? And, and maybe the chances were that the empirical error of the second model on the validation set was better than that of the first model. So then I'm going to go back once again and say, okay, let me increase again the complexity of the model and so on. So we do this a number of times. And, and the point is, as we discussed on uh, just a couple of minutes ago, that at some point, as you increase the complexity of the model, you will see that um, the empirical error on the validation set, after having decreased for a while for more and more complex models, at some point is going to start increasing. And that's a sign that you are facing uh, overfitting and uh, it's a sign that you are now going over much more uh, complex hypotheses than, than you should be. And um, it's a sign for you to stop and, and step back and um, go to uh, one of the other models. And the moment you have selected this um, model that you declare, you know, you are satisfied with, you are going to uh, offer that as, um, uh, as the hypothesis that, that you have learned uh, given the uh, data set. And you would like to give that model together with some sort of an estimation of the empirical um, error on new data. And obviously you could give it uh, together with the empirical error on the validation set. But conceptually, that's a very difficult choice to make um, because effectively you have, cho you, you have used the empirical error on the validation test as part of your overall training, going from model to model and, and deciding when to stop and so on. So this value on the validation set, conceptually speaking, has been a part of your training process. And so when you uh, publish or, or you know, um, finalize the uh, learning process and, and you give this model, you would like to give the estimation of the um, error, uh, generalization error on data that, that the model has never seen before. So then you have this test uh, set, uh, which is completely separate and it has never been used. And it's only used once in the end to uh, give this um, approximation of the generalization error. And I'm suggesting here on this slide that, you know, this could be 50, 25, 25%, but this is certainly not set in stone. It, it depends a lot from case to case. Um, sometimes you might also go for a split 70, 30, and uh, maybe, maybe here you would say, uh, you know, 50 and, and 20. Or in many cases where you have, for example, relatively little data, you would like to have as much as possible for training, so so you would go maybe to uh, you know 80, 20, and, and this uh, 80 would be split into say uh, you know 60 and, and 20, and it depends a lot on the application. So certainly these are values that you can uh, play with, and and they depend on the particular application you have in front of you and um, on um, the volume of data you have for your training.